Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time. Something that, I don't know, just warms my heart is we have started doing these deep dive sessions on Saturday. When the rest of the YouTube world is taking a day off, we go deep. We find experts to go into deeper pockets. We have seen buy box, 50, 40, 10, roommates, house hacking. We are changing lives. And today... We are going to help you plan, prepare, and add a new tool to your tool belt. There is no question, as Greg Dickerson tells us every Monday, good times never last, bad times never last. Well, we are entering a bad time. And in a bad time, life happens. There will be job losses. There will be death. There will be divorce. There will be movement. There will be all kinds of stuff going on. There will be people getting into pre-foreclosures. It happens. It happens a lot more frequently in a recession. We are going to have somebody come on that's been doing real estate since the 90s. Yes, folks, don't do the math. He's been, he's been licensed since the 90s. More importantly, he's been through many, many recessions and done pre-foreclosures before. He was the man for FHA in the last recession. He has been through the muck and the mire, and he knows what's going on. So, Ty, welcome to the show, buddy. Yeah, great to be here, Michael. And I just, I love your audience. I love everything you do. I love collaborating with you, so I'm excited for today. Yeah, so uh, just in case somebody hasn't seen, you are part of my expert series. You and I talk every Friday. We do a financial wrap-up. You give, 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 so thank you for that. Tell tells Ty's story in real estate, I don't know, in three to five minutes, just in case somebody's watching this for the first time. Yeah, so um, this is interesting, too, that I even I hadn't even thought of, but this is super cool. As a kid, and I, and I love what we're doing now, financial news is the absolute best. I hope, I know everybody in this, you know, anybody who's following you, especially if they're a part of the course, they're watching your daily news, watching some of the Friday wrap-ups. Um, even one of the things I discovered in talking with you is that realizing my very first transaction I remember as a kid was a subject to a creative finance deal that my grandmother did. She didn't even really know, but it was you know, interest rates were like 12%, 18%, 15%, something crazy. Mm -hmm. um, as a 10 year old kid, I can remember paying attention to real estate. It was like 19, uh, I was a little over 12, 11, 12 years old, 1982, 83, somewhere in that range. My grandmother saying, wow, I just got a deal of a century and we bought this fixer upper. And I'm like, how is this deal? And she's <laughs> explaining to me, she took over, she brought in cash, like a, let's call it a $50,000 down payment. And she took over somebody's 8% mortgage yeah. in a 12 to 15% mortgage environment. And that stuck with me. I remember that as a kid. You brought that out of me. Um, forward, I'm an 80s kid. I grow up 89. I graduate high school. I want to make money. I kind of know real estate is a thing. I see this guy driving these different cars, and a neighbor, Malcolm Tip. Malcolm Tip is one of my all-time heroes. He's a hero of our hometown, Vallejo, California. Um, and I started asking other kids, like, who is that guy? He's got a Rolls Royce. He's got a Bentley. He's got a Mercedes. He's got sports cars. He's got Cadillacs. Who is this guy? He drives a different car every day. And I'm like, who is this guy? And he's, oh, he's Malcolm Tip. He's in real estate. He owns rentals. I instantly knew I got to meet this guy. I got to get to know this guy. So I'm developing an acquaintance with him. I'm doing lawn service. I'm going to junior college. I'm reading books. I'm reading, um, Tony Robbins. I'm reading, uh, Robert Allen, nothing down for the 90s. It's like 91, something like that. And um, I'm obsessed, man. I know that like real estate's a real thing. It's like, I'm going to get there. So fast forward, I'm saving money. I buy my first rental. I buy it traditionally with a loan. Um, back then it was a six and a half percent interest rate. And we thought that was incredible too, yeah. right? Back in yeah. like 90, uh, uh, 93, um, but I bought my first rental. I'm still uh, taking junior college classes. I'm still doing, I'm a groundskeeper at the college. So I've got a, you know, a regular W2. And then I'm also doing a side hustle. I'm, you know, I'm side hustle. I'm mowing lawns. I got a, you know, a great little lawn service where I make an extra 15, $20,000 a year, which allows me to save for a down payment on my first place. Um, I meet a guy, he's a young guy. He ends up, he's about 25, 26 years old. He's a contractor. He, I'm doing yard work for him. And I'm like, Hey, how are you so successful? And he pulls me into his house, into his library. He has a, I've never seen a 25, six year old, 25, 26 year old with a library of full of all the real estate books, all the home study courses. This guy was really invested in himself. And he goes, you know what I do is I buy rental property and I buy them and he, 
basically described your story and my story, one rental at a time, buys a little fixer, fixes it up, rents it, refinance, burr, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, I was hooked. I got licensed in 94. And uh, man, the rest, uh, you know, and I've never looked back. I've been excited about, I've been doing deals now for 20, uh, 29 years and been licensed for 28 years. So that's amazing. Well, do us a favor. Uh, cause again, you were up close and personal with the great recession. Uh, talk about, cause that, that was my experience, right? I bought, I bought foreclosures. I did buy, I think one short sale that took like forever. So we'll get into the difference. I'm sure of what those are, but talk about, uh, real estate was actually still pretty active. Uh, yeah, because again, banks had to get rid of it, right? It, it would talk about an REO, talk about FHA and just in, in all of that. Cause I think a lot of people that don't know real estate want to point it 08. And I think both you and I agree. It's just, it doesn't have the same setup, but let's tell, let's, let's tell people what, what 08 was that way. If it does happen, they know what might be a part of this. Yeah. So absolutely. So fast forwarding, into the 90s, 2000s, man, we're ripping, roaring. Uh, we've got a huge portfolio of single families. Um, I am fixing, flipping. I am pretty much doing everything I'm doing now. I'm doing sub twos. Uh, we're door knocking pre foreclosures, which we'll talk about. I've got one of my guys on the on the call as well. We'll interview him a little bit, get him involved about door knocking. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm actively door knocking. I've got a little team of door knockers, my nephew, a few other sales guys. Um, we're, we're doing everything sub two creative, we're, uh, fixing and flipping. Um, and then we're even doing brokerage mm -hmm. and for me, I dabble out. And this is an important thing I want to just say for the audience is you really want to stay in your lane. And when you start getting out of your lane, you know, that, that saying, stay in your lane, when you start getting out of your lane, when you do, there's nothing wrong with that. But what you should do is partner with people who have tremendous expertise, experience, as well as capital. You know, time, what do they say? Time, talent, treasure, time, talent, treasure. You want to partner with somebody who's a senior league member of, you know, if you're going to do multi, you know, big multifamily, or if you're going to do development or small commercial strip centers or whatever that is, land, whatever, you really should get together with a group of, you know, mentors, people that you can partner with and learn that game. I got out over my skis. I started doing, um, I started refinancing um, a good chunk of my properties and I was buying and I was getting those negative AM loans, mm. which you and I talked about before. So those were horrible loans. They were very, very popular. They're very easy to get and you can maximize and pull out a ton of cash. And I started getting into land development. So fast forward, of course, like a lot of people, I was losing some properties, short selling properties, foreclosure. I pivoted hard though in 07, 08, I could see that it was going to be a foreclosure market because of those negative, because of those toxic mortgages. Mm -hmm. And so of course, Fannie, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac were probably my two biggest customers. I became a disposition agent, right. a listing agent. And um, I mean, we literally were handling anywhere from two to 300 properties, a portfolio of properties for typically five to eight different servicers, mm -hmm. uh, disposition servicers, uh, REO, pre -for bank foreclosure, not pre-foreclosure, mm -hmm. but these were properties that had gone to sale. Nobody wanted them. They had loan balances of five or $600,000. They were insured, Fannie mm -hmm. Mae, Freddie mm -hmm. Mac, FHA. And so what would happen is because they were insured, these properties would go to the courthouse step for 500,000 for a loan balance, but they might be only worth 350, 375. And of course, you know, the market was, you know, that was what you would call a crash. But even then the numbers were, you know, the numbers for mm -hmm. 07, 08, 09, what were the, well, the largest negative year nationally was negative 8.9%. Yeah. Was that 09 or yeah, 10? I think, it was, I think it was nine or I don't remember. I think it was nine, but yeah, it's, it was, it was bad. I mean, it's the largest year and largest negative year in 50 years. Yeah. The biggest thing, what you saw was you, the biggest thing that, that I noticed is that you could see People that, and this was interesting too, which I think is different from this market. A lot of people, I was refinancing and I was buying land deals and apartments and, you know, again, learning about land development entitlement, mm -hmm. uh, doing, you know, um, preliminary title, uh, doing uh, preliminary maps, things like that, working with home builders, you know, basically doing the acquisition, push, going to push it off, do a disposition with a home builder. Um, having verbal negotiation and contracts by the time the deals got actually entitled, 
the the developer was like, we're closing down this subdivision. We're not even, yeah, we're not going, we might yeah. be going bankrupt ourselves. So we're not sure what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So the other, the last thing we'll talk about kind of looking back and then we'll, then I'll have some basic definition questions is one of the things that I experienced last time, because a lot of these toxic loans were sliced and diced by wall street. Once a homeowner got behind foreclosure was the answer 98% of the time, right? If you, the, the stats from 2008, roughly speaking is if you got 90 days down, you were, I think it was like 96 or 97% likely to get foreclosed. Right, you were getting foreclosed this time. Right, what 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 just happened? We just had a pandemic, and banks acted different. Forbearance, yeah, they just acted different. Right, they did everything they can. We had four point eight million people at one point in forbearance, and people were screaming foreclosure, foreclosure. No, less than one percent kind of went that direction. So I think banks have learned a lesson. It's far cheaper to extend and pretend. 40 year mortgage. So we're not going to have the four sellers. And of course we don't have the teaser loans, the two and 28s, the nag am, all of that stuff. We don't have 50% of mortgages as armed. It's just not the same setup. That said, I believe we will have pre foreclosures because life happens, right? Life happens. And sometimes no, no fault of your own life just bites you death, divorce, sickness, movement, whatever it is. So why don't we have, why don't we define a few things? Sure. Um, so I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, a pre-foreclosure cannot start until day 91. Because I believe all 30-year mortgages from banks, right, the first 90 days is, is, is the workout period. So they can legally, at least in most cases, file what's called an NOD. So let's define that on day correct. 91. So let's, let's talk about that, those definitions in, in that time process. Because the pre-foreclosures, Turning into a foreclosure is a, is a timeline. We just have to understand that. Yeah. So the first step is the notice of default. And that is the official notice. And this is where, you know, I mean, honestly, as a seller, they're going to get literally, it's ridiculous, but they'll get literally 10 pieces of mail. Like they'll get it to the house, to their mailbox, to their last known address. Someone will physically come and tape it onto the uh, front door. And it's a significant moment. You know, it's a scary moment for a home, pro for a property owner. Mm -hmm. um, what is different that I can say also too, which you're right, Michael, the 90 day, the 91 day process, the banks are much more patient and they do a lot more outreach than they did back in any other time in history. Um, also, because of the internet, I believe that it is easier for actually somebody to get processed if they are trying to do a forbearance mm -hmm. or if they're trying to do a loan modification. Um, it was almost virtually impossible because of the yeah. volume back in the great recession, back in 07, 08, 09, because of the sheer volume, the banks were not equipped, the call centers, the, and you didn't have online. Everything now is online. You can almost mm -hmm. go online and you yeah. can pay your bills. You can do everything online. The internet was not as robust as it was today, back in 07, 08, 09. It was mm -hmm. not, you couldn't do that. Some banks could, most banks could not. No. So it's much, much easier for a borrower to connect with and communicate with the bank and try to work out some options. Also, the banks today, as an example, I just talked to a guy this week, um, which was, this is the first time I've heard of this. The guy is in default. Um, him and his girlfriend are splitting up kind of like almost like a divorce living together like a divorce situation they're not married but you know they're splitting up they're both on the mortgage um, the bank basically says to them um, hey by the way we're going to send you a list of realtors so the bank now is saying here's here's the solution we'll help you find a realtor to list it so that you can do a short sale potentially wow. so so that's unique. I never had seen that. That was just somebody I just talked to and I hadn't seen that before. Not that early. Yeah. So the banks are, are really working to try to get ahead for that reason, something you and I agree on, maybe for the same reasons, maybe for different reasons, but you and I both agree, this is not going to be a big, significant REO bank foreclosure market. On not the pre-foreclosure stuff, it will be absolutely huge. I think it won't be huge, but it'll be significant enough to where we'll see pre-foreclosures probably double, triple, quadruple. I'll leave mm -hmm. that up to you, Michael, to call and think about. Mm -hmm. um, 
But again, back in 07, 08, pre-foreclosures were worthless. And the reason why is because if somebody owed 500,000, they didn't have much equity. They refinanced yeah. it. The equity was sitting in the driveway, sitting on a boat, a Hummer, an SUV, a, a you know, a well, the, trailer, the, travel trailer. Again, what, what is entirely different this time, and, and you've said it without saying it, this time the debt is the asset. Last time, the people that got troubled, your your case, I mean, you were in the boat, right? You got a NAGAM loan. So your your debt was called toxic for a reason. Yep. No one um, no one wanted to see that. So, I mean, nobody wanted to, I, they didn't want that. They'll wait. Why did last time, why did in 08 pre-foreclosures were nothing? Because everybody was waiting for the bank to take the property, which would wash the loan. Once the bank, took it once it became real estate owned that's what reo is the debt was washed away the structure was gone whoever took a loss took a loss today heading into this year 98 percent of loans were 30-year fixed that's different that's yeah. the asset that's yep. what means pre foreclosures and graham stefan told us just the other day the average foreclosure process is 900 days so yep. if you were one of these idiot YouTube channels talking about foreclosures coming, yeah, maybe in 2025 or 2026, good luck with that. I'm going to fish early and often. Is that fair? So good. Yeah, no, spot on. Okay. Spot on. And I, and I think too, that if I look at, um, wait, let's see, hold on. Yeah. Okay, good. I just that transcript, it was throwing me off. I was like making sure I was turned on. Okay. So um, also too, I mean, this is such a, like, yeah, I, I love, you said a quote the other day to me, which got me tingly and goosebumps and excited, which was, you said that 80% of the mortgages, this was from Black Knight, mm -hmm. which tracks all mortgages, mm -hmm. tracks a lot, all kinds of different data mm -hmm. of property owners and transactions, real estate transactions, that 80% of the mortgages out in the U.S., are four percent or less exactly that's the asset so that's what we're playing for what we're going to be playing for over the next two to four years folks in the pre-foreclosure market is an asset called a 30-year mortgage at fixed rate debt so that's different it just is all right so now let's talk about this day 91 because i think we also need to highlight this at day 91 it is the banks legally can file an nod but as you said earlier i think they're going to not necessarily do that in mass. It could be day 100. It could be day 120. It could be day 180. Uh, Ty, uh, I, I think this is true, but you're the expert. When you are marketing or building lists on pre-foreclosures, you have no idea until the NOD is filed. Is that correct? Or is there some other things you look for? That is correct. The NOD is the actual official notice. That's the notice we work off of. There are some data providers that claim that they have delinquencies. Um, I've bought those that data. Um, I could not. It's I messy. could not distinguish. It didn't really. It was just like any any homeowner list or cold call yeah. list. It wasn't. It wasn't, it wasn't any better great. or worse. Yeah. So no. again, uh, what what we need to talk with my audience about and what I wanted to hear is the NOD notice of default. No earlier than day ninety one but can be any day thereafter bank's discretion. But that is the event that kind of turns on that will head into prop stream. For example, when I've had prop stream yep. on my system or my show before they give my audience a discount or whatever, but that's it's, the NOD is the legal document that is in the system. That is a data source for all of these providers. Correct. Correct. Okay. So now that that's filed, uh, they're likely to start getting mailers, phone calls, and what you, we can talk about here, door knocking, uh, yep. uh, text messages from all different kinds of providers. Why don't we just talk about, you know, that process, right? Somebody gets an NOD, it's in your buy box. What does Ty do? And then maybe we will bring on Ulysses to talk about door knocking specifically. Yeah. So um, what we get the list. So we pull the list every Friday. So every Friday we have an update. We have it set up and I, um, in your course, right? Everybody here is a member. Mm -hmm. So in the course, there's the video. I use um, Property Radar. Okay. I love Sean O'Toole actually might even be a great guest for you to have. I know um, Sean O'Toole is a pre-foreclosure OG. I met OG, him in like, yes. 
Yeah, I met him in like 06, 07. He actually originally was a trustee cell yeah. tracker and buyer who then kind of got into the data. And uh, he's a friend of Bruce Norris's yeah. and the Norris Group. Um, uh, but he basically created this nationwide platform. So also for some people in your audience, it may be called something different. So in, if you're in a mortgage state and a judicial versus non-judicial that all matters. So in California, and a lot of what Michael and I are going to talk about is we're going to talk about it's non-judicial. It is what's called a trustee state. And trustee means that in this case, it's not quote unquote a mortgage. We call it a mortgage, which is more of a generic slang term, mm -hmm. but really it's a deed of trust. Correct. And a deed of trust is formally, that's basically, that's where the lender's lent. It's recorded against the property. And that's the loan promissory note with a deed that secures the bank or the lending institution's interest. Mm -hmm. In your state, it might be different. You'll want to learn that. But what I will say is it's all the same. These dates, everything, are, it, they're very, very similar. Um, there's going to be a notice of default, which, again, it may be called something different in your state. But again, that's the official notice that that's, you are now officially yeah. on the clock. Yep, the clock has started. Yep. You are on the clock. And usually... So legally, they have 120 days before they can file what's called a notice of trustee sale in California, yep. a notice of trustee sale. And so the notice of trustee sale, basically, and this is where the bank says, look, we're giving you three, four months to work this out, come up with a solution, refinance it, sell it, um, doesn't matter, yep. sell it, uh, do a forbearance, do a loan modification. Of course, for them to do a forbearance or loan modification, they have to have a job typically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in almost all cases. So they have to have a job and they have to have supporting income. They just can't pie in the sky, give me a mm -hmm. loan modification or give me a forbearance. Mm -hmm. um, every bank has its own set of rules, but usually that's what the struggle is. Now, the truth is in that three or four month window, what most property owners do, unfortunately, is they stick their head in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is one of the things you need to realize about all of real estate. I keep telling folks it's a people business. And it's, it's a people business when they're behind, right? Again, all of these timelines that we're going to go through are best case. I believe in the world we are in today, all of these get extended. So before the NOD is filed, you're three months down. Yep. Right. At a minimum. Then they file the notice of trustee sale. You're now down seven months. Three plus four is seven. That's, and you have fees and interest and all of that. You know, that could go on longer, right? This is why- Big when, time. Right. This could go on for three years. And in a judicial state, it's a little longer because you got to get in front of a judge than a non-judicial. But they're all long. Right. California was over 900 days last time. New York was a thousand and two, like over a thousand days. It's just wild. So, again, these are all best cases. So at a minimum, once the NOD is filed to notice the trustee sale, you have four months. You can start marketing and talking to people. But once they file the trustee sale, what happens after that? Isn't there another 30 days or something after that? Yeah. So again, so yeah, they'll be delinquent for, let's say three months, 91 days. Then they'll get a notice of default. Then they have, let's call it four months, three, four months at that point, kind of almost like a workout period. Then at that point, they'll get a notice of trustee sale. And then used to, they used to put them on much tighter um, timelines. They used to put them at 21 days. Okay. So 21 days, they now do them at 30 days, 35 days, 40 right. days. They give them a little bit more time. And also, I want to address something you said about the 900 days, 1,000 days. Michael is absolutely right. It's very, very common that that first period of their delinquency, we'll call it. Right. A lot of lenders will let them go six months delinquent yeah. before they file a notice of default. Then they'll go another six to eight months during the notice of default period. Then they may go another, let's call it uh, 60 days for the trustee sale. So it's very common that you could get easily a year. And then here's also, Michael, something that I want to share with everybody, just so they kind of have an idea when they see these little wild card plays happening. A lot of the lenders, the trustee will stay the same, meaning whoever the trustee is, when you see a notice of trustee sale or a notice of default, that is a foreclosure processing service. That's really a law office. right? And they're working on behalf of Wells Fargo, Citibank, Mr. Cooper, SLS, PNC, yeah. whoever the servicer or let's call it the mortgage company for uh, a much easier term. Mm -hmm. 
you're going to have this trustee service, which is really a law firm that will always stay the same. But here's what happens when, why does, why does a deal sometimes set in pre foreclosure for 900 days for three years, you know, two and a half years. What happens a lot of times is that the mortgage company or the beneficial interest of that loan, what they'll do is they'll trade that loan. They'll package it up and they'll sell it as defaulted paper. And so they'll maybe take a discount. They'll sell what they call a tranche. And that's not for us to worry about, but just in financial terms, they'll bundle up a thousand, 5,000 of these defaulted mortgages and they'll sell it off to another company. And here's why. And I just want to tell you why you'll see these loans trade a lot. Mm -hmm. The beneficial interest or the mortgager or the servicer will trade. And here's why is because of TARP and because of Congress and because of our national political system, a lot of the big lenders, Wells and B of A and the big names, they don't want their name associated with this. They don't want, so they'll yeah. easily package That's it off, yeah. sell it off to like a Wall Street hedge fund kind of a servicer. Yeah. Yeah, there were people buying bad loans, bad, they call it bad paper at a discount. Uh, so then, and then they do loan workouts and, and all of that. So yeah, again, this this pre-foreclosure, what we're doing here early, it's a long process. Uh, there's a legal limit, i.e. the shortest, but realize life happens and, and you know often this will go longer. But let's say you now have somebody that's NOD, uh, you, you are marketing to them, you either mail, text, door knocked, a friend of a friend told you about it. Again, everybody should be building their network if they're in my course and, and you find out about someone. How do you have that conversation? Because again, that's most, good. most people don't want to do that. They don't want to talk to somebody who's 10, 15, 20 K down. The person may pretend like they don't have a problem head in the sand. How, how do you do it? You, you walk up to somebody, you know, they're behind, but they yep. don't know, you know, they're behind, right? It's kind of yep. that, that story. So, so walk us through all of that. Cause uh, a lot of this pre foreclosure process is having difficult conversations with somebody who probably doesn't want to have a difficult conversation. Correct. Correct. And the nice part is this is being recorded. So you can all go back, rewatch this also to the videos that we provided in the bonus content that's in there. And then also too, I'm a part of the community. So it's like, yeah. I'll make myself available again for Q and a or whatever to help anybody out with deals. So um, set everything we talked about, cause we were getting technical, yep. set all of that aside. The pre foreclosure process can be a long process. That's what we wanted to really yeah. set the stage for everything said so far. There's technical terms, a notice of default, a notice of trustee sale. Here's what I've noticed. Usually people are very responsive in the very beginning, right when they get the notice of default. Okay. Okay. Meaning they get the notice of default within a couple of weeks, they're making decisions of we've got to do something. Mm -hmm. We're going to list it with a realtor. We're going to sell it direct to an investor. This guy just called us. This guy just knocked on our door. We should probably think about doing something. So that's number one. Okay. Early. It early is better. So you want to be early on the notice of default. When Right when they, they get that notice of default, you want to contact them early. We call them by telephone. I also have one of my partners on the, this call. He'll explain a little bit more uh, about what he does door knocking, but also either early on the notice of default, early on the notice of trustee sale. Also, I just want to be really clear. We show up as a servant. We yes. show up to help. help. We show up to problem solve. We show up, you've got to lead with that. We're here to help. We're here to problem solve. If, if you have a problem and, or a multi-layer problem, we have multi-layered solutions. That's the way we see our compensating factor and our strength. If somebody kind of has it worked out, we're going to give them a bit, of, no matter what, or even if they have their head in the sand, we're going to give them a bit of, we're going to give them a lift of encouragement. We're giving them a smile, some positive words some love. We're going to love on them. But regardless, anybody we come in contact to, one of the things that's vital, whether you're cold calling on my team, you're door knocking on my team, anything like that, we always leave people a little bit better, mm -hmm. even if we just give them a little bit of positive energy or encouragement. So mm -hmm. I want to really emphasize that. That's how we have to show up. Yeah. Also, and again, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So what, something I want to say here, because again, I, a lot of people in my course and students, the last couple of years, it really been about buying for cash, right? Cash and speed. It's a very different conversation. You're trying to get the biggest discount because you have to have a certain ARV, carrying costs, all of those things. If you're going to be working in the pre-foreclosure market, it's a different mindset. 
You need to come with service. You need to listen. Don't yep. rush, right? Don't rush to a number because you don't know you don't know the problem yet. A pre foreclosure, an NOD is a problem. That much you know, but you don't know what the problem is. You have to uncover what it is. Yep, absolutely. So we're there's questions. You're asking questions. Um, I believe that we did provide a script. If I did not, I will provide a script for you, Michael. Mm -hmm. I think I put that in some of the resources. If I have not, let me know and I'll, I'll send you some scripts. Okay. Um, but one of the things is that we just ask a lot of opening questions. Also, too, when we show up, Michael, um, whether it's a phone call or door knocking or texting or whatever, we don't immediately go into, hey, you're in pre-foreclosure and I'm here to solve your problem. We don't okay. show up like that. In fact, we don't talk about the pre-foreclosure ideally. What we do is we just, we call, because here's the thing, we are cold calling throughout the neighborhood, which yeah. is, which is true. Yeah. You have a buy Mike, box to use my vocabulary. You have yep. a buy box. So you might be calling them anyway. You just have a reason to call them now, right? This showed up Correct. as a target. Okay. Correct. So we call just to give you an idea. We are very distinct in our buy boxes as well. And, you know, my team, we're making 5,000, 8,000 calls a day. Um, you know, door knockers typically will knock on, um, 25 to 50 doors a day. Sometimes that's repeatedly the yeah, same so let me, doors. Let me just ask you about that. So again, the list is, let's call it a list of 50 door knocks. You're sending Ulysses out with a list of 50. It's not like he's walking down a street hitting every door. No, he's driving. And like, let's just say as an example, today's Saturday. Um, and he has his own methodology, but we ran a team of about 25 door knockers and we'd send them out 25 to 50 pre foreclosures. And that would be kind of like your list for the week. Okay. And the idea would be, you know, some people might go and knock on five to eight doors a day and they're driving, they drive from house to house yeah, to house. Right. Exactly. Now, the way I did it, the way I did it when I was door knocking and the way I will do it, because by the way, I'm going to go back to this as well. We door knocked all last summer. It was not great. And here's mm -hmm. why. Because it was a cash market. Different market. Maybe. In a half hour. <laughs> yeah. The, you know how you sold last time? You put a sign in the yard. You were done. <laughs> yeah. You literally, all you had to do is give it to a, you literally put an ad in on the MLS and it would sell, you'd have five yeah. offers within the first four hours, right? Yeah. Like ridiculous. But door knocking this summer, very different. Very different. So, and I'll explain too, like, so when I door knock, what I would do is I'd have my normal appointments or normal day. So I would like, I would make my two, three hours of follow-up calls in the morning. Yeah. And then in the afternoon, I'd have maybe like my nephew, like in this case, my daughter's 18. She could drive me this year, right? Mm -hmm. um, you could have your spouse. It could be something if you're, you know, you and your spouse, hey, let's go get Starbucks. Mm -hmm. You drive, honey. And then you literally leave the car running and I'll jump out and go door knock. And then literally we map it out yeah. and we might go hit like 10 or 15 door knocks on a Saturday afternoon. Make right. it fun. Yeah, make it fun. So let's play it. Let's, let's, let's get into the nitty gritty because I think most people watching this is like they're afraid of that first conversation. Let's just be honest. Sure. People are afraid of being uncomfortable. Maybe this is where Ulysses comes in. You be the call. You have an NOD. You have a list. You're door knocking, whatever it is. You walk up to the door. You knock on it. They open the door. Terri yep. You're terrified. What happens next? What do you do? So ideally, a couple of things. Like So I would say when you knock on the door, knock softly. And I like to knock like as if a friend, like da, 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 like a nice like. You yeah. know, like, like it's your uncle or like, it's their, you know, that friendly knock. You're not a bill right? collector. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah. Not a bill collector, not the task force. Right. Yeah. Not the SWAT team. <laughs> yeah. Right. But a nice little, da, 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 you know, like a little, yeah, like a friendly knock, like a yeah. sweet knock. So step away from the door. And ideally too, like if the door can crack and it, the door crack is over here, I'm going to position myself over here so that if they just crack the door they can see me yep right and i want to step back further i'm a kind of a you're, big guy you're you know, a big I'm, guy yeah you, you yeah i'm a big guy i'm yeah 511 and you know i'm pretty heavy and a thick guy so i'm going to step back way off of the door also too when they crack the door so that again i'm not just hovering over the door on them yeah and really just you know hey i'm in the neighborhood i'm a local investor I was checking another one of our rental properties. We're doing a renovation on around the corner, which is true, mm -hmm. you know, because again, remember I'm yeah. whistle while I work, I'm doing different things. Yeah. Buy, yeah. And you're, you have a buy box like all of us. Go ahead. Yeah. We, we're actively looking in the neighborhood. 
just stop by to see if uh, when you know when you might consider selling or if you'd ever consider an offer. Okay. And that gets the dialogue. So here's the thing: people are usually in one of two or three boxes. They're either, "How did you know? Wow, I'm ready." As a matter of fact, you're like you're you're like, and I've had people say this: you're like an answered prayer. My wife and I were so stressed, and we weren't sure what to do with this property. And we were praying about like, literally you'll have like every now and then you'll get it, but you'll get the first category. People are ready. Like they're ready. And they've been actually, it's like, Oh, what perfect timing. So you'll have that. That that's the rare one, but it happens if you do it enough, it's a numbers game. The second one is they're very realistic. They're saying, you know, we probably need to do something. We're still trying to refinance it. We're still trying to maybe borrow some money from my uncle we're still maybe thinking about, I'm unemployed. Uh, we've thought about, we honestly, we want to get the heck out of here. We want to go to Tennessee, to Texas. I've got better job opportunities, whatever the case may be. Um, but there are people that are kind of on the fence mm -hmm. and they're weighing their options. They're maybe not surrendered. The first person is surrendered. They want out of the deal. They want done. Okay. And that's whether you're on the phone or door knocking. The second person is on the fence and they're open. They're open to you know, like, Hey, tell me about it. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about it. Maybe you can be an option, a backup option. So those people are also great. And then you get the third people, which are also great too, but these are the deep head in the sand. These are people that do not want to look at the mirror. They do not want to address it. Um, and they're like, no, nope, no, nope, I'm not doing anything uh, over my dead body, you know, whatever they'll say this stuff. But even then we love on them. Hey, I'm sure I know you want to stay. Here's the thing. You know, if you can't, you know, if it gets down to the wire, I want to be a backup option for you, okay. you know, and then usually too. So I'm going to talk about the third one, the head in the sand, the absolute no, even if they cuss at me, even if I love it, I actually love it when they, I love it because here's why I've just given somebody an opportunity to get something emotionally off their chest to unload mm -hmm. and I can handle it, right? I can handle it. It's no big deal, but they can. If somebody blasts me, I like actually like, I'm like, okay, cool. And I'll just hang in there and say, you know, two, communication, two things. All communication boils down to two things, either one, an expression of love or two, a cry for help. So when somebody yells at me, it's a cry for help. Mm -hmm. It's because they're going through it, whatever. So if somebody really lashes out, I let them go like a balloon, let them let them unleash, let them release all of that negative energy. Yeah. And then what I do is I say, you know, I'm really sorry. You're going through a hard time. I can tell you're really frustrated. You're upset. You know what? I'm not here. I know you're getting other, and especially if they're, I'm getting all these calls, you guys, da, da, da. all these door knockers, whatever. Da, and I'll say, look, I'm different. I don't really care. <clears throat> I don't really care if you sell the house to me, excuse me for coughing. I don't care if you sell the house to me or not. I've got, plenty of other opportunities but here's the thing if you need help even if you just have questions even if you're just not sure what to do if it comes down to that point i'll be two things for you one is i can be an ear to listen and two is i can obviously give you some information point you in the right direction but if you do need to sell i'd like to be a backup option for you here's my card here's my postcard my flyer my whatever mm -hmm. here's my phone number and then what I do is I go and I look down at my cell phone number. What's your number, Michael? Yeah. And you just wait. And I wait. And 80, 90% of the time, they give me their number. <laughs> but here's why. Because I've treated them with kindness. I've treated them with love. And not only that, but I didn't back down because they just came out and fired on me. Mm. I don't back down. So, so that's the worst case scenario, right? Yeah. Here's actually the worst case scenario is you're going to get a lot of no answers. So you should have like a flyer, something to leave behind, Yeah, you know, like something, a postcard or door hanger, something yep. unique. Um, I would do that too. That That's really the key. One of the things that I experienced from a lot of other investors is you have to understand, A, it's a numbers game. You've told us about the three options, ready to move, not yet, head in the sand, totally get it. But all of these are a numbers game. Very, very, very rarely is it a one call close. Don't go to the door knock. Yeah, like you have your you have your wife driving the car. You don't have her in the car because you think you're going to have a 45 minute negotiation. You're doing it because you're looking for a five minute conversation and then you're on to the next one. So have something with you, have postcards, whatever, something that's memorable, 
right? This is the one that my team has, yep. right? right? So again, have, have something that's a leave behind, have something that's a follow-up. And I love asking for their phone. I'd never even thought about that. It's genius. Yeah. And then also too, like, so we all like, we're big on cold calling. So again, yeah. the same thing, those three categories, right? You're going to get good conversations with people mm -hmm. that are really like, we need to do something. And it may be just you or a realtor, or it might be you and a couple other investors. So one of the things we do too, regardless, any one of those three categories, we just stay in front of them a lot. Mm -hmm. Our follow-up, we're very diligent. We check back. Um, you know, we're just, Hey, how's it going? Yeah. How the money. Doing? Yeah. I've been in sales a long time. This, this is, so unfortunate money is made in the follow-up you need to follow up uh have your have your ha, like if you're in my course you have a deal spreadsheet have your follow-up spreadsheet and just track it religiously make the calls touch i would tell you that the average in the last cycle was eight contact points eight yep. just plant just know that going it's not a one call close not a two call close it's it's, it's going to be something like that yeah and you're going to get like the key though and i'll tell you guys is that like to be really successful at this. So first, number one, you got to actually do the work, whether it's right. That's the hat you got on there. I love that. So it's do the work. Um, either you're going to be calling, you're going to be door knocking, or you could even mail mm -hmm. direct mail. The only thing I would say is that if you direct mail it, you better make sure that that like you have some distinction that that's not like, so I get robocalls every day. You guys all get robocalls every day. Yeah. Like you need to have something like use some kind of a special phone number so that when that thing rings, you know that that's a money call. If you're going to do postcards, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to do the non-confrontational way, because guess what? You will get phone calls, but you better answer the phone. Yeah. When they call back, that's a cry for help. If, if you don't answer, they'll call somebody else. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So the follow-up is key. And then again, I just think like for newer investors, what I see is they'll have a decent conversation with a mid-level person who's on the fence, but then they'll get all excited and think it's a lead, yeah, they, like a hot lead, and they won't treat them right. Meaning that they may overcall them. They may get overexcited. They may shoot their number out too soon yep. or try to negotiate too soon. If you try to negotiate too soon, the problem is, is you'll shoot yourself in the foot. You still may get the deal, but the challenge is, is if you try to negotiate too soon, yeah. you may be setting it up for someone else to come behind you mm -hmm. and just maybe sweeten the deal just a little bit here or there. Yeah. And, and you may miss out. So I would say just really being able to qualify and understand where people are at. Are they really ready to do something now? Or yeah. is it something that they're working on? Also too, I'll ask people, this is a good question. And again, I'll put together some script stuff for you, for you guys if I have not already given that to you, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, a great question to ask, when you have somebody who's kind of interested, either they're in that first category, they're ready to go now, they're ready to be make a decision, or B, they're on the fence. One of the questions I ask is like, hey, is this something you're like, is this something that your, your timeline, is this something you want to get handled today, the next couple of days, couple of weeks? What's your thought process? You know, how long, what's your timeline? When do you think you're ready to actually make a decision and get this resolved for you? Yeah. So getting really clear about the timeline before you start negotiating. Very cool. Well, let me, let's do a favor. You brought a, you brought a rock star with you today. Ulysses. Let's get Ulysses here. Ulysses, how you doing, man? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. How about you guys? Uh, I'm doing great, man. So uh, Ty has uh, set you up to be the man, myth, the legend, right? You are the number one <laughs> door knocker in all of California is what I've been told. Uh, so what, <laughs> the whole United States. <laughs> oh, right? the United States, dude. I've been underselling it. Door knocker oh, in the man. United States. <laughs> so uh, why don't you talk about that process? Again, a lot of people that are probably watching this would be scared to death to do that. They're walking up to a house they don't know anybody at. They're seemingly bringing brat bad news because you know they're behind and in some pain. Uh, how do you a have that courage? Talk about you know what you're trying to do. Ty talks about being non-confrontational, backing away, right? So so you listen. You walk up to the door, and someone answers. What's next? What happens? Yeah. So basically, I found out that something that helps me is uh, when I when I'm going door knocking, mm -hmm. is going with the mentality that I'm going to help somebody. That really helps me out. And I, and, you know, I do believe that we are helping them out because they're in a situation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, when, once they, you know, they open a the door, kind of like what Ty say, 
said, um, you know, hey, I'm, I was in the neighborhood and, you know, I was looking at some property. And one thing that I do is I, on Zillow, before I knock, I, I'll put on my phone, I'll put the property. Oh, okay. So I'll type in the address and I'll just say, hey, you know, I was in the neighborhood and, um, you know, I was looking at some other property, but I, I noticed, I'm not sure if you noticed, but, you know, Zillow saying that your property is on foreclosure or on auction. Do you know anything about that? Or oh. is Zillow wrong? And then they'll, you know, then they'll start talking and stuff. That's, so that's not, again, yeah, you're giving them, they're giving, you're giving them uh, an option to come forward, right? Because again, they could blame mm -hmm. Zillow. Right? Yeah. No, Zillow's wrong. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Right. They can just go off on that. And then like Ty said, you let them unload. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's pretty cool. All right. Um, so again, I, I love the idea of service. Cause I, again, I want people to hear this. You don't walk up to that door thinking deal, paycheck, money. You walk up with service. So undoubtedly, you know, some, you know, some avenues you can point them at. You can call the bank. You could do this. You can do that. You can, you really could leave them. Your goal when you leave, assuming they open the door, is you've helped them just a little bit that day, right? Mm -hmm. And also, you know, um, once, you know, once we're towards the end of our conversation, I, you know, we exchange contacts mm -hmm. and I, I always tell them, you know what, you could call me any day, any time. Mm -hmm. I, I'm here to help you out and, you know, point you in the right direction or help you out. What is that average conversation like? Again, you don't know them, you haven't met them that, but they open the door. Is it are you are you thinking the average is like five minutes, three minutes, half an hour? What what is that first conversation usually like? Because again, you're gonna have multiple with that person. What's the first one like? Uh usually like five to seven minutes. Okay. You know, so, sometimes they'll go 10 minutes, but it's really no more than 15 or 10 minutes. Okay. All right, very cool. And again, your goal when you've left is like Ty said, right? Are they, are they ready to go? Are they on the fence or they just need to unload? Right. Cause those mm -hmm. really are the three categories, correct? Yes. Right. And also, and also uh, one more thing that I want to say is um, it, it is scary the first few times, but once you, you do it and mm -hmm. you do it, it, it kind of gets easier, you know? Yeah. And uh, you know, the first time that, I, you know, that I got a foreclosure deal was actually with Ty and I was fumbling all over the place. I didn't know what to say, but because she needed help, she stayed, she stayed on with me. You know, she kept yeah. talking to me. So, and at the end of the day, you were able to help her. Yes. And she was super happy. Yeah. So, um, so Ty, maybe we should go back to you if you're done coughing. <laughs> there, <laughs> there My wife hey. just brought me tissue. <laughs> oh, she's awesome. Uh, she's the most awesome. Yeah. So I guess the last thing before we go to questions is, uh, at some point, you're you are going to have to bring up a number, right? At some point, or or some kind of financial thing, right? Whether it's price terms. So let's talk about some of the factors, right? So first and foremost, I want people to realize this is not last year. This is not a cash number. You likely have to figure out how far they're behind, right? There's yes. a there's a cost to cure. You have to figure out this is something you have never thought about before. If you go into a house on Zillow and say, hey. It's worth three hundred. They owe two fifty because that's what their 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 uh, mortgage statement says. And you want to offer two sixty? You could. That's that's not that's not this game. They're now at least seven months behind and probably more. So talk about that conversation. Like they finally tell you, tides the fifth meeting. You're on their couch. They're like, I want to sell to you. I want you to help me. You need to ask them some hard questions at that point. Yeah. So um, when, when you get into the numbers, it's like, okay, yes, we're ready to sell. We need to get something handled. Okay, great. Let's get into the numbers. How much do you owe? How much do you think you owe? Uh, we think the loan balance, usually the number's kind of off, but you can use some round numbers. Well, you know, the loan balance was, you know, 250,000. Okay. 250. And then how much is the monthly payment? Uh, the monthly payment's 1500. Okay. And how many months do you think you're behind? Uh, we're a roughly, it's been about nine months. Okay, so we're going nine times 15. Okay, great. We've got that number. Probably add on another 5%, maybe even 10%. Yeah, for, probably 10%, yeah. 
Yeah, ten percent for late cost penalties. Fees, yeah, exactly. Yep. Filing fees, all of that. But the idea is you want to round up, have mm-hmm. kind of a missed number round up. Sometimes too, they'll say, "Hey, no, I've got." This is the interesting thing. Again, twenty twenty two, right now in this modern you know internet and everything, mm-hmm. they'll go, "Well, hold on, let me just pull it up on my yeah, phone. Let, let me go to my bank." Thing. Yeah, Thank they you. really will. They'll pull it up and they'll look at it. Also, too, they're getting. By the way, if you're actually there physically in present in person, they're going to have this mail pile of of yeah. all the marketing mail, but also all of the 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 mortgage company and the trustee mail. They're mailing them constantly. So um, also too, I'm able to look at on Property Radar. I'm able to look at what approximate balances and also what the original notice of default is mm-hmm. and potentially what the opening bid is. So I can maybe see, okay, I see it's 280, but I'm still going to walk through the number with them. It's 250. They've not paid yeah. for this yeah. amount. I'm going to walk through it. What's the interest rate, exactly. right? So that's yeah. a big thing. What's the interest rate? Does this $1,500 a month, is that just PI mm-hmm. or is that PITI? Do you have a copy of the most, even an old statement? Do you have yeah. a copy of a statement? Because then I can break down and now I can transaction engineer. Now I can look at and see, okay, great. We've got 30,000, 35,000 in a reinstatement, or we've got 12,000, 18,000 reinstatement. I'm going to come up with some approximations and I'm going to say, you know, Michael, here's the thing. Obviously, we're going to buy it as is. There's going to be no realtor commission, Mm -hmm. no broker costs. No closing costs. We're going to pay all the escrow, the title, the recording fees, the notary fees. We're going to pay all of that, transfer taxes, all of it. If I could just write you a number, if I could just take over this mortgage, get the mortgage performing again, right? I could just take over the problem of the debt. Uh What I'm going to do is get it reinstated. I'm going to clean. I'm going to fix up the house, re-rent it, keep the property long-term. If I could just buy it from you and write you a check and you could walk away today, what kind of number would you need? Yeah. Yeah. These are, these are the really hard fought conversations. I would, again, I love the word transaction engineer. That's exactly how, what you should think, right? Again, in the beginning, you're a counselor, you're listening at some point when they say you're my guy or you're my gal to buy my home or fix my problem. You morph from counselor to transaction engineer. How much are they behind? What is late? You know, all of this. When do, when do they want to be out? Because maybe the school is going to be out and they really want to stay till, you know, June 13th when their daughter graduates, whatever. You are yep. a transaction engineer. I would tell you in most cases, if not all, you are going to be writing a check to somebody, probably the bank, because the, the note has to become performing. So you have to know the cost to cure. Figure that out. Second, it is very likely that they are going to need some walkaway money as well. It could be moving costs. It, it could be, they may have equity. You never know, right? There may actually be equity. They just can't have the monthly payment, right? So I love that word transaction engineer. It is really time to get into the numbers, figure it out. Um, what else do you have to say to this before we jump to student questions? Um, no, and then, so just kind of like walking through some of the actual um process so we go through we write an agreement now if you're in california i did a special video you absolutely must watch this if you're investing in california um there's what's called civil code 1695 and 1695 basically says you have to use a special contract in california if you're an investor and you're buying it from an owner occupant now if it's vacant you don't have to use the the civil code 1695 But if you're an investor and you're buying it from an owner occupant, you have to use a special contract. We provided that for the one rental at a time students. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to write up the agreement. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, okay, approximate balance of $250,000, reinstating rears of approximately Mm $35,000, right? Um, The seller is going to walk away with $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 they're getting that net money. And that's what's called an equity purchase. Here's the reality of what we're doing in California specifically. And it's really the same in all 50 states. You're ideally what you're doing is you're bringing in, let's call it the seller's netting $10,000. You're bringing in $10,000 
they're netting that. That is an equity purchase. You're buying whatever remaining equity or even negative equity. You're reinstating the loan. You're taking the note. You're taking all the other debts subject to, meaning you're taking over that. That's going to stay attached to the property. Okay. You're taking it over subject to. You're giving them ten thousand dollars. That's the equity purchase. You're buying out what remaining equity they have for ten grand, and that's the transaction. So I'm going to write all that up. I'm going to document it. I'm going to put it to all approximates, and then somewhere in there I'll put subject to confirmation forward slash verification of balances and reinstatement. Meaning, mm -hmm. if for some reason they've misled me, if for some reason we were just completely wrong, I have the ability to go back and renegotiate. Yeah. If the loan balance is 350 or there's some, they've yeah, been behind there's a surprise second you didn't know about or whatever. Correct. Correct. Also, what I'm going to do there is they're also going to sign an authorization release information. Mm -hmm. And this is important. It's going to be an authorization release information that either allows me to contact the bank on their behalf. So I can order a loan balance, a reinstatement. So I can get a verification uh, of loan balance. What's owed on the property. If there's an escrow or an impound account, I can also inquire about that to find out how much money is in there. Or I can give this to my transaction coordinator, or I can give this to the escrow title company and ask them to do it if they're willing to do that for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of depends. Some escrow companies will, some most won't. Mm -hmm. But this will also allow you to order a loan payoff, whatever the case may be. That's going to have the seller, it's going to have their name and their social security number on there. So this is going to allow you to contact and communicate with the bank. And, and the that's loan, an important And the piece. loan number. The loan number. And the loan number. Absolutely. And this is going to allow you, and if they have, let's say if they have two loans, a first and a second, mm -hmm. right? You'll have two of them, right? One for yep. the first, one for the second. Correct. This is going to allow you to deal. Also, like as an example, child support liens, things like that that come up. Mm -hmm. You have that. You can give it to the escrow officer. They can order a payoff for the child support lien. We just did one with the child support link. So that's basically it. At that point, you get all the numbers back. Now you can make a decision. Okay, great. All the numbers are what they said. Now I can go ahead and I can, you know, let's close the transaction. Let's reinstate the loan. Let's, you know, let's now we can service the loan. We can give it to a property management company to service or a servicing mm -hmm. company. Or, you know, in this case, maybe you have the loan statement and the mortgage information you get set up as the contact person, as the property manager, mm -hmm. um, so that they're sending them to you at your mailbox as the property manager. Mm -hmm. You're cutting your checks out of the property management company. Mm -hmm. And that's basically how you would move forward with the transaction. Very, very cool. So let's get into the questions. Uh, I, will, uh, I will lead them and uh, Ty or I will go ahead and answer them. So first one comes from Sean. Uh, finding the deals. Do you do it through direct mail or find someone who deals with foreclosures for their business and have them send you leads? Uh, Sean, I think the answer today, given technology is online systems, whether it's property radar, prop stream, there are probably others. Basically, you need a service that collects NODs, notice of defaults, uh, in your state or in your buy box. Again, there are people that purport to have lists of delinquencies. I think they're crap and garbage. I wouldn't waste your money, especially if you're a, you know, you have a full-time job. If if you have a team of 25 door knockers, maybe you could take a shot. But most people, waste of time. Would you agree with that? Uh, I would totally agree. And I also just want to answer the question in a way too. Like you may deal with wholesalers or other investors who may bring you deals or leads like that. Um, the only thing I would say is just make sure that it's followed based on the process we described, mm -hmm. that they're using the right contract that's compliant for your state and that you're getting the authorization. You're at, you are actually processing and looking at the verified information because you will have wholesalers that will try to bring you deals and don't just trust that because yeah. they said <laughs> yeah. the numbers were right, that they're right. You actually want to, you want to take those authorizations and you want to verify all the information the way that I described a moment ago. Yeah, transaction engineer. At that point, that that's a that that, that I think that is that's going to go in the title of this video because that's just what you are. Uh, Chester, your question about probate. We will actually do a separate deep dive on probate. I will likely get Rylas Dana, my Tuesday expert, who is a probate attorney, to answer those questions. So we will leave that question for another deep dive session. Um, Roldan, 
Could you share some of the most powerful approaches you have used to build rapport with an owner who, for some reason, found out they're behind? Uh, again, you've talked about a couple of those. You got any more gifts? Maybe Ulysses. We'll go to you first because uh, uh, Ty's having a hacking attack. Ulysses, any, any like, like, are you funny? Are you humorous? Any, any, any things to build that first rapport? Yeah. So normally, um, you know, tonality is everything. So I, you know, I look at to see how they react when I tell them about the property. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when they're like kind of shocked and I kind of just like, oh, you know, like kind of back up a little bit, like, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, basically I just kind of see how they react when I first, yeah. you know, tell them about the property. Yeah. And I can tell with your, your you are um, non-threatening, slow <laughs> speech, right? You're, these are all on purpose, right? These are all, you're trying, you're not trying to be Thai 5'11", you know, big old muscle guy. You're just trying to be, you know, get a little small and, and be their friend. Yeah. You're trying to be their friend. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I am like 5'10", five, 5'11", five, myself too. So I, you know, I kind <laughs> Dude, of- Ty, you only high up big guys or what's going on? <laughs> yeah. But again- yeah. You, uh, Ulysses, you gave us a gift that I just want to hit again. If people missed it, you have your phone with Zillow pulled up and you're like, dude, did you see this? Is this right? That's a great opening line. Cause again, you give them permission to blast Zillow, not you mm -hmm. blast Zillow. I think that is genius. I, yeah. I did not know he does that. And I agree. I think it's absolutely genius. And even what I'd say, even a safe way to like, I love what I love that. And I say the other way you can do it is you don't mention the pre-foreclosure and you just say, hey, I'm a local investor. You know, mm -hmm. we're actively looking for a project here in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, just stop by to see if you ever consider selling or if you'd be interested in an offer. And then you get into a conversation with them. And then after about 90 seconds, you might say, hey, you know, I could be wrong, but I did see some information and it looked like there was something going on with the loan something yeah. going on with the mortgage and you kind of like um, kind of back into it. Yeah. It, it. We call it, I call it when I coach my guys, I call it a gentle opener, meaning like you kind of play dumb. And we do this by the way, pre foreclosures, code violations, probate, any of the lists, any of the kind of the tougher conversation lists. Yeah. We start off and just kind of talk to them about the house. And then opening, we go, yeah. Yeah. By the way, you know, I'm just looking here and you even, scrunch your face and you're kind of like curious and tilt your head that yeah. like monkey tilt like you know i'm not sure if this is right yeah um there might look like there was something going on with the mortgage yeah. or i'm not really sure what's going on maybe there. it's a neighbor's house i'm not sure maybe i got my own yeah. yeah yeah so that's a soft way too to do it i love ulysses i think ulysses way is more effective because it's like i also believe get to the truth fast yeah. so you can dance with the, the two different methods i think <laughs> Yeah, I like it. All right. So uh, this one might be for Ty. Uh, I don't know. There is a best way. It's probably always it. When people ask best ways, I've been doing this forever. It's what is the best way for you? Right. Yep. If you're, if you're Ulysses and just the man in front of people, well, let's be clear. Door knocking is the way to go, but all of us aren't Ulysses. We aren't the number one door knocker in the country. For some of us that frightens us and you're just never going to do it. Even though you watch this, and you're like, no, I can do it. Michael and Ty make it feel possible. I can do it. You're going to jump in the car and you're going to create a thousand excuses to never do it. Yep. Some people just don't have it. Maybe for you, then it's postcards or it's phone or whatever. So, but, but the question is basically, um, do you have a best way? Is it door knocking, postcards, cold calling, email? You know, is there a best way in your opinion, Ty? I would say right to your point, Michael, spot on, know thyself know thyself. So if, you know, if you're a little bit more timid and, you know, it's a little scary getting out and door knocking, then I would say maybe cold calling. If you don't like cold calling, maybe it's texting or doing the postcards. Mm -hmm. Also, this is interesting because a mutual friend of ours, the very famous Mr. Pace Morby, mm -hmm. um, he had somebody on his team. And I love this story. A lot of people don't know this story. He had somebody that was on the team and she was really successful at door knocking. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to figure out like, what does she do? And she said, she literally pulled Pace aside and she said, you know, the truth is I don't actually even door knock. What I do is I go up to the door and I just leave the leave behind. And the leave behind said something like, sorry, I missed you. And she would just leave the leave behind. And she would just go out and hit 25 doors and do the leave behind because she was scared to death to door knock, but she would get the callbacks. Yeah. But she would take her. every phone call that called her. Genius. Yeah. But she, yeah. 
So even we didn't even really say that, but that was like again somebody that was just like oh dude, I think, knock, but very I effective. think that's genius. Have a, have a again a mailer spend some time design yours, basically saying hey sorry I missed you I'm you know whatever you wanted to say, just post it and see if they call you. I think that's genius. Yeah. What, by the way, Michael, I was going to ask you. Um, uh -huh. I think I love the mail piece. I think everybody should design a mail piece like that for your own market. Do oh, something yeah. like your that. Your buy box, yep. Your buy box, something that really speaks to your buy box. Also, too, and I just want to share this door knocking story again. This is from I, before Pace even started the mentorship. I went out there and spent time with him. He and I've been friends for a, for I would say a good short long while. Mm -hmm. um, I spent the, a day with one of his door knockers, you know, because I'm like, what can I learn? Yeah. And they had this guy literally, even if don't wait for the fans, the well-designed, perfectly designed marketing piece. They had a guy, this uh, kid that he would just go out and leave sticky notes and sticky yeah. notes. They would literally write the sticky note. Sorry, I missed you. Call me about your house, blah, 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 blah. They left the note, a sticky note. I think Pace bought, and I don't want to exaggerate. He bought like five or eight or 10 houses. The guy, the seller, they nicknamed him sticky note, Jack, because ah. the guy's name was Jack. He called off of a sticky note. Nice. that one of the door knockers left behind. So even if it's just a post-it, right? Yeah, like, something. hey, sorry, I missed you. Call me. I'm looking to buy a house in the neighborhood, right? You could literally do that yeah. and do it today and get started today. Don't wait. Yeah. To design a piece, but don't wait for yeah. the piece. Don't wait perfect. for perfection. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not ready, aim, fire. This is ready, fire, aim. Just go get better every day. Um, uh, you do run a big team. I assume you have some kind of CRM or management system. I would guess I do not, uh, but I'm sure you do. Yeah. So we use uh, Mojo, Mojo Sales. Mm -hmm. um, it has a dialer involved in it. It also has a bunch of other CRM. Most people do not need that. <laughs> right? You don't need it. A spreadsheet. If you're just yeah. getting started, like just to give you an idea, when I started, right, we didn't have the internet like this. And I can say like literally just working off of a notepad. And all I would do is write down all my leads. And then I would rewrite them the next day or mm -hmm. the night before at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Yep. And I knew, okay, this is who I need to focus on today. So keep it simple, keep it simple. So you can execute. Um, can you, so we talked about your buy box is obviously very close to where you live. You have the ability to have teams actually physically do it. Let's pretend for some reason you wanted to buy pre foreclosures. I'm just going to pick a state, Arkansas. I don't know yep. anything about Arkansas, but let's just pick it. Could you do all of this uh, from the phone and email? You don't have to door knock. Could you do it from out of town? Absolutely. So what I would do is I would, um, so a couple of things I would do, I'd make a couple of videos like training videos mm -hmm. and just explain, Hey, here's what we're doing, how to talk to people. Even doesn't have to be perfect, right? It's just you. Hey, here's how you door knock. Here's how you do this. Here's how you talk to people. Here's what to say. Here's how to yeah. say it. Yeah. Very, very simple. And then what I would do is I would get into some of the Facebook groups, mm -hmm. find investors that are local in that Arkansas marketplace that you want to be and say, Hey, look, I'm looking to squat up with some people. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody interested in squatting up? I've got this great system. I provide mm -hmm. lists for you. I provide closer support. I provide, yep. and not only that, we pay generous commissions and yep whatever. And then you recruit and then you could literally curate the list every week and send it out to your 10 or 15. We had, so with Noah Hoffman, which, you know, uh, Naomi, Jade, mm -hmm. myself, we had probably 25 to 30 plus maybe 40 door knockers that we were deploying every week. The problem was wrong timing, right idea, right strategy, wrong timing. Mm -hmm. Right now would be a great time yeah. to put a door knocking team. And especially, I think even more so over the next three to six months, yeah. I think for this everybody is the out time there, to build the tool. It. Yeah. This is the time to build the tool set, the knowledge it's coming and it's going to be amazing. Um, yeah. So again, you, you can be out of state. You also, to your last point, you could secure door knockers out of state, join Facebook groups, pay commission, just, you know, pay the infrastructure if you wanted to. I think everybody should have those conversations though, at least do yeah. some cold calling, get used to the rejection, kind of get a flavor of it. So you can relate to your door knockers. I do see some people trying to do it and they don't, they can't relate. And I see just in general, they're not having success because they've actually never, you know, how do you, if you've never yeah. ridden a bicycle, 
how could you teach me yeah. how to ride a bicycle? Right. Perfect. So. All right. Let's say you got your list. This one's about Santa Clara County, but the city county doesn't matter. Let's say you got the list. Let's say it's a hundred deep. How do you prioritize that list? Do you look for the biggest debt, the most equity? Uh, how do you tranche them? You can't treat them all the same day one. What, what, what are your high, what's, what's your, what's your top 10 in, in a list of hundred? What do you look for? There's a lot of deals in Santa Clara County. It's a good market. So let me just stay, start by saying that. What I would do is I would work around the median value of Santa Clara or below. Exactly. So that would be number one based on my buy box. Yes. Right, Michael? I, I want to be very clear. I'm so glad you said that. It's, it's, it's like, we're, like we do this together. You get a list of Santa Clara County. It's everything. Your first job is to put your buy box in. So that list of 100 becomes 35. Then you go yep. into the list of 35 and you go below the median. Protect yourself. Thank you, Ty. Go ahead. So like for me, I don't do condos. I don't do commercial. Um, I would do everything under the median. So I'm going to make up a number. I think the Santa Clara County's median value is probably like a million 25 or something. Call it a million so, bucks. Yeah. A million bucks. So I would really focus on all of those single family houses that are, you know, have retail after repair values of eights and nines probably which they do mm -hmm. exist mm -hmm. and then what i would do is i would probably for me three bedroom two bath minimums right i like houses that no are funky houses to 2000 yeah a yeah. thousand to two thousand square feet they're typically houses that are built after for me 1950 because i like mm -hmm. the yeah the ranch homogenous mm -hmm. neighborhoods and then from there then i would sort by equity then i would say okay Let's see what has bigger equity. Um, you know, I'd say let's go 20% uh, or more equity yep. as an example. Mm -hmm. And then that would probably take a list of 35 down to probably yeah. 20, yeah. 15, 18, 20. Probably 25. cut it in half, probably. Yeah. 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 So again, it's about it's about realizing the list is just going to be that. It's a list from top to bottom. Put your criteria. This is a buy box is powerful. It's focus. It's permission not to get distracted. So. I love that. And then, yeah, it's equity, right? You just want to, you want to go that direction. Uh, can you speak about getting them to move and by what time that's again, back in my opinion, not in the counselor phase. You don't do that too early. It's during transaction engineering. That's when you have those discussions. Yeah. And, and let me be very clear guys. I just did a deal and I'm getting burned on it. Um, you know, I even, I had not done a bad deal in a while and I had one where the guy, we, you know, we had an agreement. He was going to move out right after close of escrow. We held back funds. Um, he was supposed to get 20,000. He's getting $20,000 of an equity purchase. He got 10 of it up front. He was going to get another 10. And then the guy literally has just been jerking me around. And so now mm -hmm. I'm scratching my head going unlawful detainer. What do I do? You know, like just, and, and I can deal with it. But point being is that I even look at, I should have probably maybe did less money up front. Maybe um, I'm also looking at like, I don't like, you've got to be really, really crystal clear. I do not like long-term post-possession. This was supposed to be a short-term post-possession, but um, in this case, this could happen, right? It happened to me. It's happening to me. I'm in the middle of it right now. Right. Um, and so I would say that, you know, if somebody's going to get say $20,000, maybe they get 5,000 for the moving. Yeah. And then maybe you don't even close. This is the other thing. Maybe you don't even close until they secure, like with this guy, I should not have closed escrow until he actually already secured an apartment or a, you know, a room something. to rent something. storage, something. So yeah. you've got to be really careful about that. I would say that, um, you know, always hold back money if they're going to stay and have a plan and have also a plan B. Okay. If he doesn't move out now, I've got to evict him or now, which now I'm scrambling to do that, but at least I yeah. do have the hold back. So, yeah. So here's a question I've never, I don't know anything about if you don't, we'll just move on, but I wanted to ask it. Uh, what is the exit strategy of an NOD if it's filed on a reverse mortgage? Yeah, very good. Okay. So the reverse mortgage has to be paid off. I deal a lot with that. And it's interesting too, that'll be a good question. And I'm saying this to all the students as well as to you, Michael. Talk about reverse mortgages and probate and NODs when you talk to Rylas, because okay. I'm sure he's got some good stories about it. I'll I've got that. a few myself, um, but the reverse mortgage companies are absolutely ruthless. Yeah. They are not 
they they're, don't play. They're no. absolutely, this, this is not they, Bank of America, Wells Fargo people. These are yeah, these are they are sharks. When well, they're predatory. To, they want that damn house. They want the house, and even I had a deal. My uncle passed away. My aunt was in the house. They thought she was passed, or I don't know if they were playing games. But they literally, my aunt is there. She's there grieving, and they send an NOD to her. And she's like, oh, my God, I got this foreclosure notice. And I had to fight tooth and nail with them and get a letter from Social Security to prove that she was still alive. Wow. And I'm talking the amount of stress that she just That's lost her okay. husband. Yeah. Not OK, like not yeah. OK at all. In fact, maybe even as I'm talking about it, this is recent, too. Yeah. So reverse mortgages are aggressive. You cannot do a subject to with a reverse mortgage. Nope. Um, you have to pay it off. And the key, though, is with reverse mortgage companies is to communicate. Yeah. So if you're the buyer, negotiate with, typically you're negotiating with the family, right? It's an estate. Sometimes it's held in trust, hopefully, so you don't have to go through probate. Mm -hmm. You may also have a probate in process. So contract the deal the way that, I, that, the way that I'm teaching you. Negotiate, uh, you know, a buyout. Mm -hmm. Here's what it is. Or negotiate a flat price of this is a good deal. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you are going to have to originate a new mortgage yeah. and or wholesale the deal and or broker the deal and pay it off. Yeah. But the key is when you contract and you have that authorization to release information, you want to send it immediately to the reverse mortgage. You may send them a copy of the purchase agreement or the listing agreement or the whatever yeah. agreement and say, we have a timeline. We believe we'll close this transaction 30 or 45 days. And you just want to have really good communication with people and make sure that they know that you're not just walking away from this deal. It's going to foreclosure, but you are in fact, there's a transaction that's going to happen. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Reverse mortgage folks, bad people. Anyways. Uh, how do you, so how do you fund these deals? Right. Again, we talked about cost secure. You walk into a deal, you need 30 grand. Ty, is that coming out of your savings? Are you getting partners? How do you typically fund deals? The, the, the 30 grand. So typically ourselves will capitalize them. So we'll capitalize. We could borrow private money if we had to. I don't, I haven't borrowed any private money in a very long time. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I got a call coming in. Let me stop this call. There we go. You still there? Yeah, I am. You're okay. Good. Okay. So yeah, so we capitalize ourselves. Um, sometimes you could partner with someone, bring in a partner, have them bring in the funds. You brought the deal. Um, you know, I mean, I think, I think between private money and or partnering, um, you can do it. You could also just go out and originate a whole new loan, mm -hmm. uh, but then you're going to have a down payment and all that. To me, mm -hmm. the real, the real best play here is the sub two taking over. Yeah. So even if you have to come up with a little bit more money, it makes sense because you have what's called, and I learned this from Michael, mm -hmm. a blended rate. Yeah. So even if I had to go borrow some private money, you know, the 30 or 50,000 entry fee mm -hmm. for rehab, closing costs, the equity, you know, buyout to the seller. If I have to go out and borrow, let's even say 60,000, but I'm borrowing that at 8%, mm -hmm. but I'm taking over a subject to at, you know, on $250,000 of debt at three and a half or three and three quarters. Yeah. The blended rate is still going to give me a pretty good cash flow. Yeah, exactly. Here's a good question. Uh, I'm sure this has happened to you or maybe to Ulysses. You go up to knock on the door and it's tenant occupied. How does that conversation go? A tenant opens the door, they're paying their rent, but then you find out the seller's behind. Um, what do you do in a situation like that? Well, first, you know, I first when I go in there, I ask if they're the owners of the property. Okay. And if if they say that they are or they're not, okay. if they're not, then I just say, Oh, do you happen to have their contact information? Got it. And then you'll most so, sometimes they won't want to give it to you. Yeah. But, you know, then I just tell them, oh, I just work with the real estate group and I wanted to see if I could talk to the owner. Yeah. And again, I think, if, again, back to your little tip about Zillow. If you showed the tenant the Zillow screen, mm -hmm. that'll get their attention. Oh, yeah. yeah. Here's the owner's number. Let's have some conversations. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I actually have I had that case a few weeks ago where, you know, they didn't want to give me the number. And I was like, look, I just want to help out because I found this on Zillow and I just want to see if it's accurate or if there's a mistake. And, you know, they, they still didn't want to give me the number yeah. in that case, but yeah, you can just try. Yeah. All right. Uh, a couple more questions to get through this. Uh, okay. So people are asking about reverse mortgages. That's not this conversation. I will reach out to Rylas and see if we can do that. 
Uh, oh, lots of lots of thank yous and whatnot. So it looks like we've gotten through all the questions. Uh, Ulysses, uh, bring us home. You want to give us one or two more things to wrap this up and we'll go to Ty after you? So I know that door knocking could be pretty time consuming. And, you know, if I could help somebody out with that is um, I use an app, Road Warrior, mm. and you type in the addresses and it literally like makes the routes easy for you and it'll, you know, to just Map. create an yeah. easy route. Nice. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for being us with us this Saturday. Thank you for giving this channel and frankly, all of YouTube. This will be on YouTube Sunday morning. Uh, valuable information. Uh, this 90 minutes will, will help many people. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate you. Ty, you know, I think uh, you've helped me. You're going to help me add a new tool to my tool belt. Uh, I told you many times, this is something, a skill I do not have. Uh, I think we are entering a time unlike the last recession uh, where the mortgage is an asset. Last time it was toxic. Nobody wanted it. It was stupid to get it. That's not going to be the case. I think you have shown us why this is powerful. Uh, Pace Morby is doing lots of stuff, as we both know, in this space. More and more people are going to come to Sub2 and Creative Financing. Bring us home. What are your, what are your final thoughts? Um, this is home. So I would say for everybody here, stay plugged in to uh, the One Rental at a Time network. Um, I've been involved, and I, this is not an exaggeration. I've been involved in all kinds of mentorships and all kinds of high level, you know, uh, pace. I'm, I lead a, a daily dial course, uh, two hours every week for pace. I teach a class for, for pace in his group, the sub two group. Um, and I can wholeheartedly say, Michael, that you are one of the most generous over deliver, over deliver, over deliver. And so for everybody out there, you're at the right place. If you need more help with certain categories or certain subjects, Michael is going to find the experts or bring people back on. I would be happy to get back on again on a Saturday morning with you. Um, you're in the right place. So it, number one, a lot of people I see, they'll hire, they'll get in a mentorship, they'll kind of get in there and then they bounce to another one or bounce to another one. You don't need to do that. You're in the right place. So that's what I want to emphasize, number one. Number two is, it's back to, your, to, to that beautiful baseball hat you got on. <laughs> do the work, do the work, do the work, do the work, do the work. So um, that's it, folks. Just go out there and do it. It literally is one step at a time. And, you know, for me, it took me a couple of years to get my first deal because I was still trying to figure it all out. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and then once I got it going, man, I've never looked back, man. I do, I'm deals and deals on deals on deals mm -hmm. on deals, but it takes time to get there. Yeah. Same thing, like Michael, it took time for you to get, for you and mm -hmm. Olivia to get where you're oh, at. So, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, for all that you do, folks. Yeah. It's time to go out there and do the work. Yeah. So as I wrap this one up, bring us home. I don't, this, these rules, these ORAT rules, if you don't have them, go get them. The, you can get them on my website. But again, pre foreclosure, exciting, new opportunity, deals, cash flow, sub two, exciting stuff. But it's never permission to forget the rules. Let's go through them one more time. Number one, focus. None of this matters if you don't have a buy box. Rule number one. Rule number two, daily discipline. It doesn't matter. Look every day. Do the work every day, 20 minutes a day. Rule number three, grow your network. I don't care if you're putting door knockers in your backyard or out of state. Grow your network. Be of service. Give. Door number four, none of this matters unless you know your average deal. We are only doing great deals. We are not guessing. Do the work. Figure out average. Number five, bad things happen. Ty told us about a deal he's struggling with today. He gave somebody 10 grand. They didn't leave. He's learning from it. That's number five. Bad things will happen. He won't do that again. He'll give two grand. He'll give 2,500. He'll wait till they're signed to lease for an apartment. Doesn't matter. You, bad things will happen. Learn and move on. Number six, this is a five to 10 year commitment. I am not promising, nor would I ever talk about instant wealth or easy money. We are going to build generational wealth five to 10 years in the making. And number seven, audit your freaking network. We are going to go through a time where negative headlines are going to spike. If you have people that are muck and mire of that, throw them away, walk away. These people will bring you down. People will get wealthy, but it won't be the people that are afraid and doing nothing. These rules don't change. Ty gave us a new tool. The rules don't change. 
All right, everybody, enjoy your day. Thank you for the new tool. Ty, Ulysses, you are amazing. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.